Please take your Bible and turn to the book of Psalm chapter 18. We've been talking about the attributes of God, and we mentioned the Lord is powerful. We understand that by creation. And then we said the Lord is pure. He is without sin. And then we said the Lord is personal. There's a personal relationship with God through His Son, Jesus. And He wants to have a personal relationship with you. In Psalm chapter 18 and others that we look at, I want to look at this attribute of God that God is protective, and, and God protects His own. God not only loves His own, saves those that want to be saved, but He protects them. And uh, in that sense, you know, a, a mother is protective of her own. In the natural sense, a mother is very protective, wants to protect her children, and uh, she does that. In that sense, the Lord protects his own as well. In Psalm chapter 18, the Bible says in verse 1, <clears throat> I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress, and my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom will I trust, my buckler, and the horn of my salvation, and my high tower. I won't go through and read all of these times that the psalmist said my, but it points out for the, the last point that we made about the Lord that he is personal. And the psalmist is allowing you and I to understand that God is personal and that he personally owns him as his God. And you and I would do well to do that as well, that we make God uh, our God, personal God. It doesn't matter if somebody else wants to own him as personal God. It doesn't matter if somebody else wants to be close to him or not close to him that you can enter into that closeness. And uh, the psalmist is making that clear as he says, I will, and the Lord is my. And you look at the number of times that he says he is my, and then you look at what follows after he says he is my. And uh, it's, he's his rock, fortress, deliverer, my God, strength, trust, buckler, horn of my salvation. And that means power and strength and my high tower. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, so shall I be saved from mine enemies. Verse 3, mine enemies. And you could put whatever enemy that you want there, that uh, God will deliver you from your enemies. Uh, even if it is yourself, God will deliver you. God can deliver you. And you make God personal, and you realize that God is protective. When you realize that God is personal, you realize that uh, you were made by the Lord and you were made for the Lord, and thereby you belong to the Lord. So whatever God does is right, and whatever God does with you is right. And all that I have to do is make sure that I am following the Lord, that uh, to the best of my human ability, guided by the Holy Spirit of God, that I am in the will of God, and then whatever God allows, God allows. I'll give you an example of that. Stephen is first martyr in the New Testament. And uh, he was a righteous individual, as far as you can tell from the scriptures. We understand that all are sinners. But uh, he was a preaching deacon. And, and looking at his life, not necessarily a long life, but a victorious life, and he preached the word of God, and because of that, that uh, he was stoned to death. Now, he died right as well, because within the storyline, as he was dying from being stoned to death, he called upon the Lord and uh, said, uh, paraphrase, lay not this sin to their charge. 
And so he died like Jesus. Now, you and I in the human aspect would say, well, that, that wasn't right. should not have happened to him, and God should not have allowed that. But uh, God did allow it. The Lord Jesus stood up, gave him a standing ovation, and, and entered him into heaven, and that's God's choice. And so when I take stories, truths like that from the Bible, and I embrace those truths, and I have God personal in my life and own God as my, 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 as the psalmist says, then it'll make a whole lot of other things easier in your life. If you and I are in the will of God, Stephen was in the will of God, he died in the will of God. And uh, it'll make things easier for you and I instead of questioning everything about why, 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 why God, it's my, 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 my God, personal. And so God is protective. Now, you notice this as well <clears throat> in the Psalms if you go to chapter 34. In chapter 34, the Bible says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he heard me, and delivered me from all my fears. This is a psalm of David. They looked unto him, and were lightened, and their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him, and saved him out of all of his troubles. Now, you notice this in verse 7. The Bible says, The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him, and delivereth them. This is a protective attribute, a protective quality of the Lord, that the angel of the Lord encamps round about them that fear him. And so my part of that is to have a reverential fear of God, and uh, that... Uh, God sees it, God knows it, and then I give myself over to the Lord, and the Lord, He delivers us, however that He pleases, however that He chooses, He delivers us. And that is, uh, the, the Lord uh, sends His angels, the, the Lord assigns His angels. You and I don't see these things taking place, and a lot of times we are delivered when we do not realize we were delivered, and other times it is very real in our life that uh, we were uh, delivered out of something. Uh, notice this as well in Isaiah in chapter 49. I'm saying that God is protective. Isaiah chapter 49. In Isaiah chapter 49, you'll notice in verse 25, the Bible says, But thus saith the Lord, even the captives of the mighty shall be taken away, and the prey of the terrible shall be delivered. For I will contend with him that contendeth with thee, and I will save thy children. And I will feed them that oppress thee with their own flesh, and they shall be drunken with their own blood, as with sweet wine. And all flesh shall know that I, the Lord, am thy Savior and thy Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. This is a protective prophecy of the Lord. Now, he is uh, speaking uh, in, in particular to the, the nation of Israel, but in application, it is for all of his children, you and I, born-again children of God. And so this has taken place, and it certainly will take place again. Notice as well in Isaiah and in chapter 54. In Isaiah chapter 54... 
and in verse 17. The Bible says, No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper, and every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. This is a protection that uh, God affords to His people. He affords this to His chosen nation of Israel. And I realize that He has allowed His nation of Israel to go into captivity at certain times because of a chastening hand, a punishment, a judgment. But um, He has also not allowed them to be entirely wiped out as well. No, no nation has been able to wipe Israel off the map as they desire to. Even as of recent, where statements have been made that they desire to wipe Israel off the map, and they won't be able to do that because God is protecting them. Likewise, you can apply that to the church. The Lord Jesus said that in Matthew 16, 18. Upon this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And uh, the gates of hell are trying to prevail against it. There is an overall animosity against the church, against the Christian, against the Bible. It's because of the signs of the times that we're living in. But it, uh, it shall prevail until the Lord comes back and takes us out of here. And so uh, the Lord is protective of that. He's, he's protective of you. Uh, as an individual child of God, he, he protects you. There's times when God has protected you that uh, you, you did not realize. And uh, there are other times when you uh, sigh a sigh of relief realizing that you just got protected. But there are a lot of times when you don't know and God has protected you because of that. And that's the protective quality of our Lord. You notice this in um, Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18. God loves children. God loves the little ones. And uh, this portion of Scripture is in reference to the little ones, but it's also applicable to a child of God because the Lord Jesus calls us children. First, second, and third John, he uses the, the term uh, little child or little children. It's a term of endearment that you and I are, but he also certainly does love the little children. In Matthew chapter 18, <clears throat> in verse 6, the Bible says, But whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe unto the world because of offenses, for it must uh, needs be that offenses come, but woe to him, uh, woe to that man by whom the offense cometh. Wherefore, if thy hand or thy foot offend thee, cut them off, cast them from thee, for it is better for thee to enter into life halt or maimed, rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into everlasting fire. And if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life with one eye, rather than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. Take heed that you despise not one of these little ones, for I say unto you that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. And so he makes a reference to the little ones and it's to the children. It could be applicable to the child of God and it's to the, the little ones as well, the little children. And uh, he makes reference that they're angels. It seems to apply that they're our uh, guardian angels for the, for the little ones and for the child of God. Other portions of scriptures would allude to that and uh, says uh, that you uh, don't despise the little ones. You know, the, the little children, those that uh, come in on the van, those that uh, come in, uh, you know, the, the ride-ins, the walk-ins, and those that uh, ride the van, the, the little children, they, they love Jesus. They have a love for church. 
And it is uh, not until they get uh, older and that they get a taste of the world and experience the world that uh, they, the difficulties really uh, take place. But uh, God loves those little children, and they are impressionable. And you need to speak to them about the Lord Jesus and show them the love of Jesus and uh, get them to Jesus as soon as you can. Uh, God is protective. Notice this as well in Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1. In Hebrews, the basic overall theme is that Christ is better, and he is uh, better than the angels. So we, get, we understand the, the overall theme of Hebrews, that Christ is better. He's better than everything, anything, everyone. Christ is better than the angels. But in uh, chapter 1, as the writer is defending the fact that the Lord is greater than angels, Angels are created beings, and the Lord created these angels. And of those angels, we understand that uh, Lucifer, or the devil, Lucifer, that became the devil, he was a, an high, uh, uh, the anointed cherub that covereth. He was a created being. Now, the devil is not, uh, he was not uh, everlasting because he was created. The devil is not uh, all-knowing because he was created but uh, the devil did have a choice and the devil chose to uh, disobey God and thereby fall from um, heaven fall from God he became the devil well there was a certain amount certain number some would say one-third that fell and went with the devil and there were others that did not fall angels can not be redeemed. They don't have, uh, they cannot be saved. They cannot repent and be saved. It mentions that uh, the angels look into a church service. It, it mentions in uh, the Pauline epistles about uh, the ladies having a covering on their head. And I'm not going too far with that rabbit. The, the point is in that portion of scripture that they are covered themselves with submission. It's a difficult thing for people. It's a difficult thing for the ladies, but they've covered themselves with submission because of the order of which God has made. And the Bible says the angels look into that. And um, these angels are created beings. And the Bible says that the Lord Jesus, of course, is greater than, than the angels. Jesus was not created. He always was. He's the Son of God, and He's God the Son. He always existed from eternity past. And so He's the one that is powerful. He is pure. He is without sin. He's personal. He wants a personal relationship with you. But these angels were created. And He says in verse 13, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 13, But to which of the angels said He at any time... Now He says, when He says, said He... He's speaking about in positional God the Father at any time sit on my right hand speaking to God the Son until I make thine enemies thy footstool. You see the book of Hebrews, the author is uh, submitting the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ to his hearers or like those that were still Jews or in uh, Judaism or saved out of Judaism to allow them to understand that Christ is better, that Christ is Messiah, that Christ is God in the flesh. And um, he is teaching them that uh, Christ is better than the angels. Now, he said that, and he said that in the Psalms. Now, we're going to verse 14 of saying all of that. Are they, speaking about the angelic host, those that did not fall, not all ministering spirits, and so the angels are a spirit being. Now, there is times when they have been given permission to have a corporal uh, body that is seen. You could see that in the account of like Abraham, where the angels came 
and appeared to Abraham. One of them was the Lord Jesus Christ, pre-incarnate Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? There's a couple of thoughts on that of people who have read that, interpret that to say that since God knows who will be saved, they keep them alive until they are saved. I would hold to the fact that uh, those who are saved, that the ministering spirits uh, help them. And uh, when the Lord Jesus Christ was in the Garden of Gethsemane and he was praying to God the Father, he's God the Son praying to God the Father. But he, as the man, Christ Jesus, the mediator between God and man, the Bible says that uh, he prayed and it was in agony. And in his humanness, he said, if, this, uh, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. In other words, that way of salvation, the sins of the world being laid on him, his separation from God for uh, that portion of time. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And when he made it through that uh, trial of prayer, when he made it through that trial of prayer, because he prayed that at least three times, he prayed that three times, and then he came to accept not hearing from God the Father because he always heard him, because he always did the will of God, not hearing that there would be something different. He said, this is the will of God. And so there's periods of time that you enter into of prayer to God, and I'd say that you pray through until you get an answer. And that answer can be yes, no, wait. And uh, sometimes, as other people have said, I, I thank God for things that he didn't answer my way at times. And that God answered the way that uh, he knew was best. Because the Spirit, uh, he, he answers, Romans chapter 8. And he makes intercession for us. I think I know what I want. God knows what I need. And we praise God for that. But when that took place, then the angels came and ministered to the Lord Jesus at that time. When he came to accept this is God's will, then comfort came. And there's an application for that. You pray, you pray, you pray, and then uh, God brings you some comfort. And uh, anyway, he says, there are ministering spirits sent forth to minister to them that are heirs of salvation. I said all of that, pointed to those scriptures to say, God is protective, and God protects his own, and God gives little children mothers to protect them, and, and praise God for the mothers who want to protect their children. And praise God for those who do. And praise God for a dad that protects the home and builds a battlement over the home and protects the home. And then I realize that after they're grown up and, and gone, then uh, you have prayer, you have God, but they have to make their own decisions as well. Here's another one. I'm, I'm just talking about some uh, attributes of God. We said that he is powerful, obviously. He's pure, he's without sin. He's personal, and he is protective. Here's another one that I like. Uh, God is patient. I'm glad that God is patient. And uh, you and I are basically impatient, but God is patient. You know, a day with the Lord is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like a day, and so forth. And some equate that, that uh, we are living in that 7,000th year uh, time frame. You know, the young earth, I am a young earth individual. I believe that uh, the earth was created in uh, six uh, literal 24-hour periods, uh, the morning and the uh, evening were the first day and so forth, and not a day-age gap theory. I believe in the uh, six 24-hour uh, periods of creation. And some would say that um, we are either in or entering into that seven-day because of the earth being six to 7,000 years and say that the rapture is right around the corner. And the signs of the times looks like the rapture is right around the corner. And uh, he could come at any time, and we understand that. We are to believe that and live like that no matter what, that the Lord could come at any minute. And that's how we are to live. But it also means that... Uh, God is timeless. 
So what makes me antsy and what makes you antsy does not make God antsy. God is in control. God is eternal. He always has been. He always will be. And so in that sense, God is timeless. He does not have a time clock, though he has a plan. Man has time. And that became uh, because of the fall. We entered into time. And before the flood, we understood that they lived a long time. You could do some uh, scientific you know, reasoning with that about uh, the waters and so forth and the blockage of sun. But now we don't live hundreds of years. You know, three score and ten, and by reason of strength, four score. And there's some that live past a hundred, but we uh, are taken home. So we have time. But God is patient. You notice this in Numbers in chapter 14. Numbers chapter 14. In Numbers chapter 14, you notice in verse 18. The Bible says, The Lord is long-suffering and of great mercy. There are truths that are laid out in the Old Testament that are revealed also in the New Testament. You understand that. He says, The Lord is long-suffering. That long-suffering means He's patient and of great mercy. That means that uh, he withholds what uh, we are due. It simply means that we don't get what we deserve. That's mercy. Forgiving iniquity. That means he forgives sins and wants to forgive sins. Uh, Iniquity has to do with the, the old sin and twisted nature and transgression. And by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children under the third and fourth generation. Some of that means that what an individual sets into place, that it can be transferred on down to the children. And you you can look at your past and you can look at your family tree and look at some things that goes on in that, and the men can do this especially, and see what goes on in that family tree And they can say, well, it's going to stop here with me and quit doing it. So there are certain things that uh, follow family traits. There's a whole lesson on that and uh, has to do with demonic activity. But an individual can look at their family tree. A lot of times we look at our family tree. We want to see where our family came from and those names and all that. You could also look at your family tree and see what baggage has been brought along and say it's going to stop right here and put an end to it. And because if you keep doing it, by nature, those that watch you may keep doing it. And so you you can stop that. But the Bible says the Lord's long-suffering. And uh, he gives us that truth as well in 2 Peter 3, 9. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. Hebrews, James, Peter, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, the truth reveals a little additional light on what you read in the Old Testament of why God is long-suffering. The Bible says, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness. Now, part of that would mean, as you would look at individuals, and if you have had dealing with individuals in your life, in your line of work, who have been maybe um, disobedient. Maybe you've worked uh, at a place, 
uh, at work and uh, you worked alongside somebody and you thought, man, if I was a boss, I'd have fired that guy a long time ago. Or if you've worked at a school and you've witnessed uh, young people, children or up through adults, and you say, you know, man, if I was the teacher, I wouldn't put up with that. Or if I was the principal, I wouldn't put up with that or something. And when you and I make those statements, we have to look in the mirror. And so uh, he says, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some men count slackness. In other words, why is the Lord allowing this to happen? Why is the boss allowing that to happen? Why is the principal, the teacher, why is somebody allowing something to happen? You know, why is the mayor allowing them to burn cities down? You know, all that kind of stuff. Now watch this. But is long-suffering. God's not slack. He's long-suffering to usward. Why? Not willing. It is not the desire that any should perish or die and go to hell, but that all should come to repentance. That's one of the reasons why God allows certain things to go on is because he is long-suffering. Now, there is times that you read in the Old Testament where judgment comes swift and sure, quickly. And then you could look at your own life, and you don't have to admit it, maybe growing up in school, at home, or whatever, where maybe you got away with something. And uh, you didn't get a paddling, or you didn't get uh, in trouble. And, and maybe not. Maybe you were the perfect child, maybe. And, uh, but uh, I'm glad I didn't always get what was coming to me. And I'm glad that God is long-suffering, not only with people getting saved, but after you got saved. You, you would have to probably admit, even after you got saved, you say, well, I heard the gospel and I got saved. Probably not the first time you heard the gospel, but maybe. But even after that you got saved, there was a whole book of things you were supposed to be doing that you didn't start doing right away. And there's a whole book of things that you were supposed to quit doing that you didn't quit doing right away. That means that God's long-suffering with you before you got saved, and God is long-suffering with you after you got saved. And that's because God is patient. Praise God, He allowed you to be born. You didn't have choice in that, but He did allow that. He, he instrumented it, that you were to be born. You know, and I realize that people in the Bible have said, wish, you know, hadn't been born type of thing. They get the, the Job mentality. But because that you were born, he offered you a choice, which is the greatest thing God could give you is a choice. He didn't make you a robot. And he gave you the choice that you could choose to get saved. He gives you a choice that you can choose to serve him. He does not make anyone get saved. He gives you a choice. And... Uh, if people want to die and go to hell, they can. But if people want to go to heaven, they can. Anyone can go to heaven if they want to be saved. Anyone can serve God. Anyone can repent, turn around, and start serving God. Notice this. It's the power of choice, and it's because God is patient. Deuteronomy chapter 30. I'm almost done. Deuteronomy chapter 30. In Deuteronomy chapter 30 is a great portion of Scripture that I like because that, uh, it allows us to understand that God gives you a choice. If you're not saved, you can get saved. And uh, if you are saved, then you can serve God. If you want to serve God. And then if you want to serve God, you can serve God with all your heart or just a little bit. Just as much as you want. You can be just as close to God as you want. You can have all of God that you want. Deuteronomy chapter 30. In verse 15, the Bible says, See, I have set before thee this day life and good, death and evil. 
He said, I'm setting this before you. This is Moses giving the children of Israel this choice. And that I command thee this day to love the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways, to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments, that thou mayest live and multiply, and the Lord thy God shall bless thee in the land where thou goest to possess it. And that still pertains to today. That if you give all to God, he gives all to you. And it ain't about making a deal with God, sitting there saying, well, God, I'll serve you if you do this for me. God, I'll, I'll serve you if you give me this and such. No, it is you first saying, God, I give all of me to you, Romans 12, 1 and 2. And whatever you want to do with me, it will be a blessing. Now watch this. But if thine heart turn away, it's, it's, it's the heart. And only God has the power to convert, convince uh, the heart so that thou will not hear. This is the word of God going in one ear and out the other, but shall be drawn away and worship other gods and serve them. Other gods are anything that takes the place of God. I denounce unto you this day that thou shalt surely perish. You'll wither up and die. Don't mean you'll lose your salvation if you are saved. What it means is, is that you'll be a dried up Christian. You'll be like a raisin. That's what it means. It means if you want, you know, I'm saved and on my way to heaven. Well, praise God for you. How's the trip? We'll say it's drier and cracker dust. Well, that's your own fault. But now it is. He, he says it right here. And uh, he says that if, you, if your heart turns away from God, it ain't the preacher's fault. Preachers bringing out uh, the Word of God. And if you turn away from God, it's your own fault. If you don't want to serve God, it's your own fault. But if you do want to serve God, you'll be blessed. And that blessing, the Bible likens it to be by a well-watered area. Bringeth forth his leaf. Whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Now watch this. I denounce unto you this day that ye shall surely perish and that ye shall not prolong your days upon the land whether thou passest over Jordan to possess it. I call heaven and earth to record this against you, this day against you. Now watch this. I like this. That I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore choose life that both thou and thy seed may live that thou mayest love the Lord thy God, and that thou mayest obey his voice, that thou mayest cleave unto him, for he is thy life, and the length of thy days, that thou mayest dwell in the land which the Lord swear unto thy fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, to give them. He says, I, I set this choice before you. God, God, is, God is patient. He sets a choice before you. There's, that's, you know... That's what he does. He sets before you a choice, and I praise God for that choice. I got a few minutes. Let me give you another one. Go to Psalm chapter 139. Psalm chapter 139. God is present with you at all times. If he seems far away, that's me and you. If that is the perception, that's because of you and I moving, not God. God is, he's powerful, pure, he's personal, he's protective, he's patient, and he's, he's present at all times. There's no place that you can go that God's not already there. That, that, that's God. The devil is not, God is. The devil is a created being, he's not omnipresent, but God is omnipresent. It means he is everywhere at all times. Psalm 139 and in verse 7, the Bible says, <clears throat> Whither shall I go from thy spirit, or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I 
take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea. Even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. It's speaking about the fact that God is present at all times. It is not meaning that God is polytheistic. In other words, you don't say like a tree hugger that God is in the tree. Now, God created the tree. God created the dirt. God created the cow. But it's not saying when you make this statement, God is present at all times, and an individual says, oh, I know God's in the trees and, and things. It, it's not equating uh, God-like characteristics to the trees. God made the trees for you and me and, and this earth. I believe that this earth is the only uh, planet that is populated by human beings. And so he's, he's made these things and the birds and the rocks, but... God's not in that rock. He's everywhere at all times. He sustains everything at all times. Look at Isaiah 43, and we'll close with this. Isaiah 43. In Isaiah chapter 43, the Bible says, But now, thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, uh, nation of Israel, you know, Jacob that became Israel, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee. This is a purchase price out of Egypt. It's the purchase price of you out of the world through the blood of Christ. I have called thee by thy name, thou art mine. So the nation of Israel is his, and so is the child of God his. When thou passest through the waters, and it's not if, it's when, thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame be kindled upon thee. And I know that we have the example of the boys in the fire in, in Daniel, but it is speaking of an application that whatever that you go through, God is going to go through it with you. When humanly speaking and human thinking gets involved in saying, well then, you know, why did I wind up with this disease and so forth? You wound up with that disease because we live in a fallen world. You wound up with that disease because God at least permitted it. You wound up with that disease so God would heal you and you give him glory. You wound up with that disease so God could take you home if you're a child of God. And so you better start thinking positive instead of negative. As a child of God, God is powerful. He can do anything he wants, anytime he wants, with anyone he wants. But God is pure. He is without sin. Sin cannot be equated to God. He's personal. And that you say, my God, my God shall supply all my need. God is protective. God loves little children. God loves you. God is protective. God is patient with others to get saved and with you to serve. And God is present at all times with you. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, dear Lord, for the study on some of the attributes of God and uh, that you are all things. We thank God for that. We pray for the service that follows, dear Lord, that, that someone comes in lost, they'd get saved for a saint of God to be encouraged and that Christ would be high and lifted up. We ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Amen.